Welcome to The Sales Buzz. I'm Rick Amey, your host for this exciting Brooks Group webinar. Thanks for tuning in. Today's topic, avoiding fatal sales management pitfalls. And I'm here with Bill Brooks, CEO of The Brooks Group. Bill has been a sales consultant for 28 years. He heads the Brooks Group, an international sales and sales management consulting firm based in Greensboro, North Carolina. He has authored, count them, 18 books, including three national bestsellers. And we will get started with avoiding fatal sales management pitfalls. We've talked about the positives. Let's talk about the negatives. Who and what distracts sales manager most of all? Uh, in many cases, it's um, uh, themselves. <laughs> In some cases, it's the organization for which they work. Uh, in some cases, it's not knowing what to do as a sales manager. In many cases, it's getting confusing messages from the sales force. Um, my job as sales manager of our company, I'm the CEO and the sales manager, is to stay on this thing all the time. I recently went out just a few minutes ago. We took a break before we started to do this and I met with two of our salespeople. I wanted to get feedback on specific accounts, where they were, how they were doing it. What happens is it's easy to get so involved in something else that you forget the basic rudiments which is coaching these people to top performance. And that is it's in itself a full-time job even though we know that that's an impossibility for most sales managers. Well, so, so how do sales, manager, sales managers settle in to this poor performance, in other words, not doing what they really ought to be doing? Well, in some cases, they never settle in because what I've heard from a lot of sales managers is they would like to be doing the right things, but the organization puts them in such a position that sometimes it's very, very difficult for them to do those things. Let me give you some examples. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, ordering products, handling customer problems, worrying about delivery, uh, accounts receivable, uh, organizational politics, planning meetings, strategic sessions, communication meetings, defending the sales effort to the rest of the company. I mean, it, it, you get involved in all of this kind of stuff, and then what happens is you're not doing what you really should be doing. You know, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I hired on to coach the team. I didn't hire on to be the athletic director. You, know, well, see? you know, What percentage of the time is it? Is it that? Is it, is it that the people that are uh, up above the sales manager causing the problem, and what percentage of the time is it the sales manager's mistakes on his part? I'm, I'm going to say that probably the largest percentage is the organization mandating it rather than the sales managers. I think sales managers go into the job because they really want to have more of an effect on the entire sales organization and culture. But in many cases, some of these things are dictated to them, and all of a sudden they fall into it. And then what happens is it's like changing a habit. You know, people I say put your hands together, and they do that. And I say which thumb is on top, and they say right or left, and I say take them apart, put it together with the opposite thumb on top, mm -hmm. and they have trouble doing it. And then I tell them I want you to do this the way you did it the second time for the rest of your life. Well, the truth of the matter is that they're not. Mm -hmm. See, so all of a sudden you fall into a habit pattern, and then you're supposed to change. And old habits do die hard. So I'm not going to blame the sales managers exclusively, but I'm going to suggest to some of you guys out there, you know, you fall prey to this thing and then it becomes easy. Uh, there's nothing harder than being a sales manager. But, but if, you, if you are a sales manager and your superiors are making it difficult for you, what do you do about that? Good question. That's called managing up. <laughs> okay? Which is, which, is yeah, a which, whole, I, which is hard to do. Yeah, which is a complete management topic. We could, have, we could have a three-day seminar on how to manage up. But here's one of the big things that really does work. If you're constantly being pulled away from what you think is important, you need to make sure that when someone in this management structure suggests you do something or works on, you ask you to do something that's not related, here's a great thing. Simply say, okay, I'm working on these other four projects here. Which of them would you like me to eliminate or drop in order to handle this one? Now they understand, wait a minute, they're overloading me. You know, maybe, mm -hmm. look, I have, a, I have a trip next week. I'm going to go out and travel with Susan and Jane and Bob at three different cities in three different days. Um, which of those days would you like me to give up so that I can handle this? And I suppose the shrewd way to do that is do it in a non-threatening, non-defensive way and just informationally say to them, 
which of these do you want me to do rather than be antagonistic yeah, about it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's everything in life. You yeah. know, it's, it's not what someone says, it's how they say it that makes the difference. And that's just one methodology. That's called managing up. What, do you, what if you are distracted and the sales force is not performing? What do you do? Well, if they're not performing and you're distracted, you just better quickly make a decision to go do it. Here's where the issue is. When you are distracted, yet they're still performing. Why? Why is that an issue? I mean, if, they, if, they, if they're well, delivering the goods, what difference does it make? Because here's what happens. They could be delivering the goods at a time that's very critical in your business. That, but, but what happens is the economy could be good. There could be a demand for your product. You could be selling a demand product. You could be in a target-rich environment. You, they could be giving the product away. They could be not getting any margin. Just because performance is there doesn't mean that anyone's doing anything. And then what happens, and I've been in this thing long enough to see it. I've seen recessions. I've seen all kinds of things. What you find out is who is really good when the going gets tough. Mm -hmm. If you're in a target-rich environment and the, and, and the marketplace is strong, as we used to say, you could send a dog out and they come back with an application. It, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Basically, what you're saying is if you're distracted and the sales team is performing well, you basically don't know what the heck is going on. Yeah, because here's the, here's, here's the question, Rick. How well could they be performing given the circumstances? If you were, if if you were working. Attention. In other words, yeah. you could take yeah. this thing to a whole new level. But the problem people have is good enough is good enough, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and so you could drive this thing up to another whole level if you, in fact, were doing the right things at the right time for the right reasons. Uh, one of the things that, that, that's been around for many years, and as you know, for many years, I kind of specialized in time management, did several albums with the Nightingale Konak Corporation. It's kind of a, an interesting topic for me. Here's what it is. There's a big difference between being effective and being efficient. Effectiveness is doing the right job right. Efficiency means that you're doing a job right. So you could be t very efficient and totally ineffective. Make sense? Yeah, I got you. So, and what happens is if you're good at something, that doesn't mean that that should be the something that's in the job. Mm -hmm. Big difference. So you've got to be paying attention to actually to both of those. Yes. But here's, here's what's manager. interesting. If you're effective by that definition, you're automatically efficient. Because right. if you're doing Everybody's the right good. job right, the first thing is to make sure it's the right job. And if you do it right, you're effective. So, effect, so, so if you're effective, efficiency is, is included. Basically. Yes, I mean, it's implicit. Yeah, it's implicit. Okay. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at the, the distractions of sales management, and we're also going to look at what sales managers ought to be doing. But let's start with the distractions at, uh, at, to begin with. The distractions of sales management and how to ensure you're doing your job the right way every day. Administrative work being number one uh, distraction. What do, you, what do you have to say about in that? In fact, we've, we've done research and found out that that's even true of salespeople. And here's another thing. Administrative work is necessary because you have to manage the function. But we've also found that people tend to fall into doing um, repetitive, repeat, stress-reducing rather than activity-related kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Other people tend to fall into the activity trap. The activity trap is when you're so focused on what you're doing, you lose sight of the purpose for which you're doing it. So you've got reports on salespeople, memos, emails. So you get caught up in the activity trap, and then you're dug in so deeply you can't get out of it to coach the sales team, to run sales meetings, to do sales training, to get in the field, uh, to work on pay plans, et cetera, et cetera. That's what you should be doing, but the administrative stuff sometimes gets in the way. So, so I, I gather the solution to administrative work probably is effective time management. Rick, I'm going to suggest to you that the secret to anything in life is effective time management. Time is the space between eternities. It's the stuff of which life is made. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll tell you what, if you can't manage your time, how can you manage anything, including other people? Right. So, I mean, you're going to have administrative work no matter what job it's you have. It's going to be part the of it. You just can't let it out of control. Right, exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, number two in terms of distractions of sales management, operational problem solving. Here's what I'm saying to you here. Let's say, for example, that you sell uh, buckets, okay? And uh, every time there is some sort of breakdown in the bucket manufacturing procedure, you know that that's going to affect your ability to have the buckets delivered. So then you're getting involved in the bucket manufacturing to see if they can expedite this thing. And here's something to make it worse. Your company has been manufacturing and selling buckets for 40 years. But every time you do something, it's like the first time it was ever done. 
So operational inefficiencies quite often drag sales managers into the issue. For example, and I'll tell you why. In a book I wrote last year with Dr. Larry Steinmetz called How to Sell at Margins Higher Than Your Competitors, he had done some research that said, okay, what is the one thing that will never allow you, ever allow you to charge a premium price for your product or service? Delivery problems. So sales managers figure that out, so they try to get into the operational issues mm -hmm. to make sure that the inventory is there. And so now they're looking at inventory levels, and they're doing administrative work. And the sales force is out there saying, help me, help me, and nobody can help. And, and so what do you do? Do you, you just extract yourself from the operational uh, problem solving? Uh, what, how do you manage that problem if you're not supposed to be involved in it? What you do is you try to manage from the top with it. Whoever's in charge of some of these operational things, you need to let them know very clearly, succinctly, and I don't care if it creates problems. We are having these issues. Please advise me when they're resolved. But I'll tell you what happens. We, we get so, we want to protect our salespeople. They're embarrassed out there in the field because things aren't being done right, and we want to expedite the solution. Um, at, at the risk of sounding bitter about this, maybe some of these operational people ought to go out and interface with unhappy customers <laughs> and find out what it's like to be driving up and the guy's saying, oh, I'm going to get this person three or four times. And I'll tell you what, the operational difficulties will probably work themselves out more quickly. All right. Fighting for respect for the sales function. I'm going to suggest, Rick, that most companies have to define their culture. Now, let me give you a quick example of this. Some companies are marketing driven, some are sales driven, some are operational driven, some are operationally driven, some are administratively driven, some are R&D driven. You know, here's what happens. If the sales function is not in the top two or three, the sales force is always in trouble. Because what happens is there's short shrift paid to them. Because it's the only profession in the world that looks so easy, yet is so difficult. So what happens is, People are now saying, I don't know if we need a sales force. Every time Bob and Susan come in here, they create problems. Listen to this one. They sell stuff we can't deliver. They sell things we don't have. Well, they do. That's, not, that's what operational. Mm -hmm. and, and so what happens is you end up fighting a war to defend the sales function. So think about this for a minute. You're doing a lot of administrative stuff. You're trying to put out fires about the sales function's performance. And then you're also involved in operational difficulties. You're also doing order, uh, order involvement. You're handling customer service problems. And again, where's the sales force? Out on the street saying what? I don't know how to sell. I need, I, you know. And you know what? They're not asking the right questions. They're not selling value. They're prematurely quoting the price. They can't overcome sales objections, right? Mm -hmm. Or price objections. And so what happens is the whole thing tends to collapse. And you, my friend, are the leader of that organization. So you better tend to your knitting. You better stay at what's important to you. But what do you, you know, I, I hear you say that, but I know that there are sales managers listening to this saying, well, that's easy for you to say, Bill. But if you worked at the organization that I worked at where we are having troubles with operations, we're having trouble getting respect for sales, I'm overburdened with administrative work. What do you say to, to those sales managers who are not being able to overcome those difficulties? At the risk of sounding cavalier? Mm -hmm. Some of them may have a decision to make. So if you're not able to if you're not able to delegate to the people who are really responsible for those efforts and and try to get them to fix these things and they don't get fixed, then maybe it's then time. maybe after you give it a good shot, you say, you know, I'm not so sure mm -hmm. that this is the right place for me. But the the key here but you're obviously getting at is you shouldn't be distracting yourself unnecessarily going off and doing these things instead of staying home. Arbitrarily. Doing, yeah, yeah, arbitrarily. And what can happen, it. although a lot of this stuff is a pain in the neck, mm -hmm. it at least is done inside the confines. You don't have to get in your car, go out and see any people, get on an airplane, and you know, that desk gets pretty comfortable. Do you think some people, do you think some people get involved in, in these distractions because they want to get involved in these distractions? Frankly, yes. They're tension relieving rather than result producing yeah, activities. That's, yeah, that's what I think. Yes. Now, I'm not casting stones at everybody because in some cases that stuff is thrown at you. I've been in those kind of jobs. And frankly, I had one as, as a, in a very high level executive. In fact, I was the president and, and I was involved in everything except what I thought I should be and I, I really resigned from that company um, because that's not what I've been put on this earth to do. 
other distractions, order tr you mentioned this, order tracking, uh, inventory issues, customer service, all the same thing, isn't it? Really? And all related to sales, because sales includes service, service is sales. Mm -hmm. Inventory, how can you sell something if you don't have any inventory? But the truth of the matter is you shouldn't be involved in the inventory. You're not the inventory control person. It's the inventory control person. What you need to have is an overall effort, and sales needs to be one of those efforts. We have been talking about how to hire good people, but how in the world is a sales manager coming into an organization know in advance that he or she is not going to run into an organization that is going to trap him in a lose-lose proposition because he's not going to get the kind of support he needs in inventory and order tracking and customer service and, and sales function uh, respect and operational problem solving. What does the sales manager have to do before he takes that job to make sure he doesn't get sandbagged on all this stuff and gets distracted? Look at this broadcast again. <laughs> look at those issues and ask those questions before you take the job. Talk to the person who's in the job currently, because in many cases, maybe that person is being promoted or leaving, and ask how much of your time do you take on this? How much of your time is required to do that? You see, one of the things in life, Rick, listen to this one, it's a whole lot easier to get into something than it is to get out of it, no matter what it is. <laughs> Afraid so. Okay. Let's talk about what sales managers ought to be doing Hiring, coaching, and retaining. Yeah. Number one, hiring the right people. Number two, coaching those people to greatness, which means you have to go out in the field to do it. And then retaining the top performers. See, the name of the game is not losing people. The name of the game is retention. And if you hire the right people and you coach them the right way, and if you have the right compensation plan, etc., etc., they should, in fact, be retained. Now, the interesting thing about it is the only thing worse than no turnover is high turnover. So you want to have some so you're constantly swirling the mix a little bit and raising the bars we've talked about in other broadcasts. What, what, what is your favorite method for retaining good people? Bribe them. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'll tell you what I think it is. It's, 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 it's being, it's, it's like a friend of mine wrote a great book on leadership. And here's what he said. He said, if you're going to be a great leader, he said there are two things that are prerequisites for being a great leader. Number one, is impeccable integrity. Your word is your bond. Your commitment is your commitment. The way that you think and the way that you feel and the way that you act are all integrated. The second one is timely personal feedback. Let me give you an example. If someone is terminated from a job and they're surprised, it's the manager's fault. Because they've let this thing, they didn't face the truth. They didn't face the reality. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do is three things. I try to lead by example. I try to have impeccable integrity. And I try to give timely personal feedback. Interesting that you have not mentioned commission. You've not mentioned salary or any, anything like that, which is what I expected you to talk about. I would, I would think that that would be the key to keeping a good salesperson. Well, here's what it is. If you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. So what you have to do is when the person comes on board, you have to pay, have a pay plan that they can live with. I'm not going to be held hostage by anybody who comes to me and says, I have a better opportunity, I can earn this. I say, go, because we know what we can pay and what we can do. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we probably will be doing a broadcast about compensation plans, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But what you have to be able to do is to have a reasonably decent base. This is what I, what I like. And then the opportunity to earn significant commissions and bonuses based upon performance above a certain level. So that, frankly, the sky's the limit, but you don't go broke paying them. Expediting the sales process. What you need to be able to do as a sales manager is to have a solid handle on closing ratios, how long someone's been in the pipeline, when you expect it to, 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 to finish, what are the percentages? When do I have to go out in the field and help you? Okay, Do it a couple of times with people. Don't always be closing the sale because then they're dependent upon you. So you, if you, here's the other one. If you don't have a sales process, you can't expedite it. Right. So I go back to the methodology again. You have to have a sales methodology. And part of your job is it, kind of like one of our clients does a wonderful job in consulting. And they, their specialty is speed to market. Now, what speed to market means, for example, they did a, a project with the uh, the naval uh, air folks. 
they took the training time down and knocked months off it. Now, what that meant was that the product is the pilot, speed to market. In other words, the faster mm -hmm. you can get the sale closed, right. the, the, the more money you're going to have. What you don't want is you don't want this thing to be hanging out there for several years. I asked in the hall, one of our salespeople, before I came in here, I said, Steve, where are you with such and such? What step are you in? How long have you been in there with them? When do you expect it to close? Uh, we're developing software now, uh, we call SAM, that we're going to have on the market uh, in the not too distant future, which actually tracks all this inside the impact selling system. We're going to be integrating customer prospect management mm -hmm. with our sales system to expedite the sales process. Another step for uh, what sales managers should be doing, holding the salespeople accountable. Yes, being held answerable for their own actions and their own results. There are far too many organizations, in my opinion, where the there is there's fuzzy accountability. Remember we talked one time in one of the broadcasts about orientation. Okay? Right. The orientation should include things like how many active prospects should you have? What happens if you go three months without hitting your sales goal? See, if I'm able to keep track of the leads and keep track of the expediting of this thing, I should be able to hold, hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. The monthly reporting that we teach people to do in our symposiums teaches them how to keep these things between the lines. Because having trained hundreds and hundreds of sales managers, the two big things are there's no sales methodology and there's very little accountability. So in a, sen in a sense, you're saying that if you do it right, you can, you can really manage the sales process much the same way the bean counters. There's no question about do, it. Do what they do. And, and you know what? Well, to do less than that is an abdication because I'm going to tell you, it's as old as the hills. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And you can do that with the sales function if you'll take the time to do it. Sales managers should also be interacting with other department leaders. Yes. This goes back to not getting immersed in these other things, but working with the people who manage other departments to make sure they can get it done. By the same token, if they give you a message to tell the sales force, you need to tell them that. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book uh, two years ago called The New Science of Sales and Persuasion. And, and one of the things that we, we talked about in that book was as you sit at the table and you've got operations, customer service, HR, PR, uh, uh, chief operating officer, uh, accounting, marketing, whatever, all these departments, and the sales manager or VP of sales is seated here. Does he or she have an equal seat at the table? And if you do not have an equal seat at the table, you've got a problem. And a decision. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Monitoring lead flow, which which seems to me an extension of what you're already already yeah, talking but, about, but, which is is managing the sales process. But what I'm talking about is before the sales process. How many leads are you getting? Sales is driven by leads. That was right. the old uh, Hollywood or Broadway play that later became a movie. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Seen it. Brutal. Brutal. Do you remember that that, that Jack uh, Lemon played uh, uh, the machine, mm -hmm. the machine Levine? And the machine Levine was a salesperson who was past his prime. And he wanted to get back to where he was, and he couldn't do it. And they had the leads provided. Remember, Alec Baldwin was the manager. Mm -hmm. okay? And he came in and made the presentation. And he said to Jack Lemon when he's standing there, hey, you, sit down. He went to get some coffee. He said, coffee's for closers. I mean, this was really yeah, old school stuff. That's why I said it was stuff. brutal. Yeah. Now, but here's the truth. He actually stole the leads was going to sell the leads. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Glengarry Glenn Ross, I mean, listen to me, the name of the game in sales is how many leads you have and how high your conversion ratio is on those leads. Success in sales is driven by lead flow. More people have failed in sales because of a lack of qualified leads than for any other reason. Really? What happens if you have no one to talk to or they're the wrong people? Let, let me give you an example. A uh, client called us today and said, that they were talking about a lead generation company. And now we may have an observer from a lead generation company, so get ready to, to email me and blast me. Uh, the question was, um, 
do we have one we could recommend or what do we think about it? Several years ago, when it was really rough in the marketplace, we actually used a lead generation company. They were to call and make an appointment for our person to call them mm -hmm. and to set up a time to go see them. And we operate all over the country and around the world, as you know. So a sales call for us is very expensive. We did this for about 30 days. And what happened was our people would call and the person never remembered talking to anybody. They didn't talk to anybody in the first place. The, the, the lead generation company misrepresented what it was because they didn't understand it. So it was a list of cold calls. Yeah, it was cold calls because people don't like to cold call, and I don't mm. recommend cold calling anyway. It's just that we, I was spending thousands of dollars a month on this lead generation because I'm convinced that the name of the game is lead generation. Now, we can do a seminar on that, or we can do a, a webinar on that. We have got seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven ways that we can teach people to prospect for business. We'll do that. Because it's so important. That's what drives success. And that lead generation is a big thing for sales managers. And as we get to our final two steps of what the sales managers should really be doing with their time instead of being distracted, analyzing sales data. Yes. Looking at the macro numbers. I, I just went through and did a five year study of where our top customers came from, who they were, how we got them. In other words, how, how, how and then I, what I want to do is I want to clone those successful methodologies. And I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, I don't care how long you've been doing it or whatever it is, you will be surprised at what you'll see. But I will also tell you that you'll see a triangle that goes like this, that a minority of your customers give you a majority of your revenue. And you've got a lot of people down here that don't generate as much. But the interesting question is, sometimes they're the profitable business mm -hmm. because you got the net. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So maybe we could talk about that. But what I'm going to tell you is that's the process, this, this prospect uh, uh, analyzing data about the organization. And finally, field coaching. Field coaching, getting out in the field. You know, I, I spent 14 years as a college football coach. I can't imagine how the team would have performed if we gave them a lecture at 3 o'clock, told them to go out to practice on their own. <laughs> Nobody doing anything with it, and at 6 o'clock, they come back in, and we go play on Saturday. You're playing Russian roulette. With these people out there in the field, and if you're not field coaching because you're caught up in this administrative work or the operational issues, I'm not saying you don't do any of those. That's necessary. But don't let it be a preponderance of your time. So these are the steps to take to avoid being in a management pitfall as a sales manager. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for joining the Sales Buzz. This has been a Brooks Group production.